In the ancient Byzantine Empire and the contemporary Middle East, approximately between 400 and 1000 AD, experimentation with musical instruments continued to produce inventions and contraptions that could better express what the people at the time saw as musical ideals. The Byzantine Empire, also known as the Eastern Roman Empire, had adopted most of its musical traditions from ancient Greece, and these would often bleed out of its borders and into the surrounding territories. Among these traditions was the ideal of the continuous sound, often accompanying vocals. This ideal was so important that the writer Al-Akfani As-Sahawi, in his early 1300s book self-described as the proper guide for the person striving towards the highest goals, had a section dedicated to the concept of uninterrupted music. He wrote, Human tones have an effect upon the soul, take hold of it, etc. Then they are interrupted by pauses which destroy the pleasure. A few different methods have been invented in order to help realize this ideal, largely based around the musical concept of the drone, a single note or chord played or repeated continuously. The Nubians, a people from the Nile Valley, would pluck drones on lyres as they sang. Similarly, the Persian rebob would be plucked as a drone underneath singing, and lutes would provide drones with a free string. Perhaps the most extreme example of this ideal existed in the flutes and other wind instruments of the region. These would frequently include flutes with more than one pipe, and it was common to have at least one pipe that provided a drone. In order to create a continuous sound, the players would practice circular breathing, which allowed them to play even as they inhaled. Using this technique, players would sometimes create uninterrupted music for hours at a time. The earliest image of the triple pipe in Northern Europe appears on the 8th century cross of St. Martin on Iona. At present we're aware of ten images of the triple pipe in early British and Irish art, all showing three tubes of similar length. The idea of a double length bass drone comes from Sardinia, the Mediana in Re Maggiore. A variety of triple pipe after a 9th century grave slab at Ard Chatton Priory in Argyll, an early outpost of the Irish Church. I look forward to playing instruments made of woods available in medieval Scotland, but my priority is composing music. Without a repertoire possessing some kind of northern identity, the early piping of Britain and Ireland remains a silent collection of images.
Numerous automata have been created to realize this musical ideal as well. One was the bagpipe, in which a player would constantly fill a bag under their arm with their breath and squeeze it in order to produce a constant airflow. Though the most well-known in the West may be the Scottish Great Highland bagpipes from the 1400s, a much more ancient form was the Tulum in Turkey or the Askalos in Greece, both different names for the same instrument. The Tulum, like some flutes of the time, had two pipes which could each be played independently. This method was far more accessible in terms of creating continuous sound, omitting the need for circular breathing. Thank you. 
Another continuous sound instrument was the water organ, a far more mechanical device which utilized pressure from a higher water source, such as a spring, in order to pump air through pipes played by a keyboard. This required a system to route the water many meters above the instrument itself so it could drop into the mechanism and produce the pressure for the air.
Among these traditions was the ideal of the continuous sound, often accompanying vocals. This ideal was so important that the writer Alak Fani as Sahawi, in his early 1300s book self-described as the proper guide for the person striving towards the highest goals, had a section dedicated to the concept of uninterrupted music. He wrote, Human tones have an effect upon the soul, take hold of it, etc. Then they are interrupted by pauses which destroy the pleasure. A few different methods have been invented in order to help realize this ideal, largely based around the musical concept of the drone, a single note or chord played or repeated continuously. The Nubians, a people from the Nile Valley, would pluck drones on lyres as they sang. Similarly, the Persian rebob would be plucked as a drone underneath singing, and lutes would provide drones with a free string. Among these instruments, however, was one peculiar and mysterious one which appeared in Persia. Ancient accounts describe a strange mechanical object in which a wheel bowed strings, some of which were shortened by tangents attached to keys, and others which sounded a continuous drone. Apparently with no better name, the writer called this contraption a wheel instrument. While it is believed that this may have been a Persian invention due to the ancient accounts of it, it's not known precisely when or where it was created, as there is so little from the area that has been recovered regarding its presence. However, at the turn of the millennium, this instrument would become an inextricable part of everyday life in Europe and in a surprising capacity. In 711 AD, the Islamic Moors from northern Africa invaded southern Spain and occupied it, installing a new emirate which became a caliphate 200 years later. Though the caliphate would dissolve during the Middle Ages due to perpetual Christian attack and economic pressure, European culture was changed significantly by the Moorish occupiers. Art and cultural practice traveled along Islamic trade routes from farther east, and among these was a peculiar object the wheel instrument, though at the time it was known by a different name, the symphonia. This instrument was peculiar not only because it used a wheel and a crank, but most of all because it was one of the few instruments that required two people to play it. One person would cradle the body of the instrument in their lap as they turned the crank, while the other would hold the key chest as they played melodies. These instruments were sometimes as long as a meter and a half, and would produce deep pitches described as soft and sweet by those who enjoyed it. Others, however, were not so impressed, and when it was criticized, it was common to hear it described as loud and nasal. This instrument found particular popularity in the church, as it suited the often solemn music being practiced in it. The clunky mechanism meant that only slow melodies could be played on it, and the drone helped produce the halteton organum common to the church, in which one voice would hold a single note while the other would sing a melody over it, coming back to rest on the same note as the drone during pauses. The earliest depictions of this two-player symphonia exist on portals to churches in the 1100s, but it's almost certain that they have been a part of the culture of southern Spain for some time. Of all the places it was depicted, however, there is likely one place from which it spread all over Europe, the Shrine of St. James in Santiago de Compostela in northwestern Spain, a popular destination for pilgrims during the Middle Ages. It became such a regular part of church music that, in the 1200s, it was given a name unique to the church, the Organistrum, though this name was short-lived. 
But while the symphonia was seeing use in Christian religious music, smaller versions were being created and used in secular music. Traveling performers took note of the unique sounds that the symphonia could produce, but these people typically played as solo acts, and their instruments had to be portable, barring them from using the large two-person instrument. Despite this, the musical possibilities were too enticing to ignore, and so, another form of key was developed. The push key. These were unique in that they could not slide freely, but instead fit snugly in their keyholes. The player could push the key down to stop the string and leave it in place as they move their hand to another key, enabling it to be played by a single person. These newer versions were also much smaller, sometimes taking the form of a box with all mechanical components hidden inside, and they quickly became a standard part of the minstrel's repertoire. Soon, it became so important that the troubadour Giralt de Calanso listed it as one of the nine instruments that a minstrel must learn, and Christian images of holy kings and angels would appear either alongside symphonia players or playing the symphonia themselves. With the popularity of the instrument growing, development of new mechanisms continued, and by the end of the late Middle Ages, the most efficient method of playing a melody was discovered, the sliding keys. These keys, rather than pulled or turned from the top, were pushed in from the bottom. While this made the player unable to see the keys they were pressing, the ability to play faster melodies and the ease with which they could be played made this variation of the instrument far preferable, and eventually, it became the standard for symphonias all over Europe. In the late Middle Ages, they also had larger instruments like this, sometimes even permanently installed, that it takes two people to play, one to turn the crank, and the other one to manipulate the strings, either by putting their fingers on it or uh, to press keys that push these shafts that shorten one of the strings, which is called the chanterelle or the melody string. The other strings are drones. This particular instrument has four strings. I have two tuned in unison. One is the chanterelle and uh, the frets, which are manipulated by these keys down here and that allows you to play the melody. And I have another, another string tuned a fifth apart. And I have this one that's disengaged right now. That's a fourth apart. So whenever I want to, I can quickly disengage this string, engage this one so I can play in a different mode or in a different range. What I have on the strings is cotton. This softens the scraping sound. Tuners over here. The crank over here. The keys over here, working on gravity. Uh, just use uh, regular violin rosin, commonly available just about anywhere. Usually a hard rosin is best. Here's a demonstration. But the high esteem of the instrument would not last, and soon it would decay from the highest echelons of society to the lowest. During the Middle Ages, physical handicaps were considered not only an impairment, but a reflection upon the soul of the person with them, and likewise, anything associated with the handicapped would be viewed as tainted. By the late 1300s, symphonias were beginning to pass from practiced musicians to blind beggars, and enough of them were playing symphonias that the sound of the instrument was irrevocably tied to their identity. This favor for the instrument was likely in part because of how simple it was to learn to play, due to the limited number of keys and the relative simplicity of turning a crank.
However, with no means to maintain their instruments, along with limited ability and a small repertoire, the droning music that they produced was often warbled and repetitious. Changing temperature and humidity would warp the wheel, the keys would stick and bend in their keyholes, and strings would cease to hold their tuning. In Germany, where the instrument had inherited the name lyre, it became an epithet for cheap goods or annoying sounds. The word for a symphonia player, Leiermann, became a synonym for flies due to their buzzing drone, and the cheapest goods were given the prefix Leier in reference to the fact that it was all a blind Leiermann could afford. The one place in Europe where it did not lose so much importance was France, where it would still be played by higher class musicians. The Symphonia was also favored by begging instrumentalists who traveled between cities and rural towns, contributing to the loss of status, and it's possible that beggars began to earn more money even than poor minstrels. As such, minstrels would sometimes turn to beggars, erasing the boundary between the two. By the time the Symphonia reached Eastern Europe, it was solely in the capacity of an instrument used for begging. Compounded with this was another issue in the late Middle Ages. Due in part to the frequent wars and the number of men who joined the clergy, there were significantly more women than men in every stratum of society. However, women were generally disallowed from most forms of making money, and since there weren't enough men to marry, their opportunities were limited. Many took to traveling, acting as artists and performers, and a favorite instrument of these women was the symphonia. These women, however, were regarded lowly, and so the status of the instrument deteriorated further. Even as the instrument passed into the hands of beggars, minstrels were still traveling with it and playing at public events, but this practice would not last. Traveling musicians would often undercut local musicians, and so the latter formed unions to petition their local governments in order to protect their incomes from the travelers. One of the demands they made was to limit where these travelers could play, allowing only local musicians to play at the highest paying venues. With these measures came a division of kinds of music, and as the symphonia was a traveler's instrument, it became limited to and associated with the commoners in poorer areas. These traveling musicians also had bad reputations, referred to as having a careless way of life, and as their station lessened, so too did their appearances in higher class social events. Where the Symphonia had once been a common sight at festivals, it now was only seen in the poorest places. Despite all of this, the Symphonia remained an important part of the folk music traditions of each country, with each area crafting its own versions of the instrument. Though the body usually retained a guitar shape, other aspects differed, especially the number of strings, the number of keys, the size of the wheel, and the tuning. At some uncertain point, the trompet string was added as well, allowing the player to keep a rhythm with a buzzing bridge. This association with the poor did not degrade the instrument's reputation uniformly, and it was regarded differently at different times and in different places. With such variation came new names for the instrument depending on its location. Its German name was Lyre, while in France it was given the name Veal after the old violin-like instrument with the same name fell out of fashion, and in England it received the unceremonious name Hurdy Gurdy. The true origins of this last name are unknown and subject to widespread speculation. Some posit that it is a bastardization of the phrase hurly-burly, referring to disorder and loud noise, while others claim it to be an onomatopoeic expression to describe the motion of someone shaking their bottom, as it was a dance instrument. Sometimes, different regions would have different words for the same instrument, and while it appears there has been no official tally, there may be dozens of unique names. But while its association with the blind did not entirely erode its stature in certain places, its popularity and reputation in Europe was irrevocably tarnished. 
Notably, it was included in the famous Hieronymus Bosch painting, The Garden of Earthly Delights, from around the year 1500, where the Symphonia was included in the rightmost panel depicting hell, alongside a bagpipe. The instrument was also associated with begging children, often referred to as Savoyards, whether they were from Savoy or not, who would sometimes have a marmot on their shoulder to attract attention. The complicated station of the instrument was described in a 1636 work by Marin Mersenne, saying, quote, if men of rank played the veal as a rule, it would not be regarded with such contempt, but because it is played only by the poor, and particularly by blind men who earn their living from this instrument, it is held in less esteem than others, but then it is not as pleasing." End quote. What Mersenne couldn't have expected, however, was the radical transformation that the instrument would undergo in less than a century. In the late 1600s and early 1700s, the leisure practices of the French aristocracy were undergoing significant changes. For some time, it was considered unsuitable for those of high station to attempt to master an instrument, as it was less important than their duties as an aristocrat, and that such mastery should be left to the lower classes. An anonymous letter in a French newspaper of the time read, quote, it can, indeed, be permitted under normal conditions to devote oneself to music and to instruments to a certain point, that is to say, as much as is necessary to make oneself agreeable in society and to obtain entries into the social world, but for the nobility, they must be occupied with a broader outlook. They are accountable to their country, to the names they carry, and to the talents of an altogether different importance." End quote. This outlook didn't stop some aristocrats from acquiring and learning to play the more difficult instruments, such as the flute and the violin, to perform with and for each other privately. However, many of the instruments proving popular were not deemed suitable for women, due to how unladylike they looked when playing them, while instruments that rested on the lap like the guitar and lute had gone out of style. This relegated them to instruments typically used only for accompaniment, such as the harpsichord. Therefore, if women were to perform in duets or as a soloist while maintaining decorum, another instrument would be required, and they would find it in the newly christened veal. Around that time, a new form of symphonia had been created that closer resembled the modern hurdy-gurdy, with multiple melody strings tuned to separate notes and made more compact while retaining its full range, making it more suitable to the upper class. This instrument, critically, could be placed on the lap while it was played, and required no motions considered unseemly for a woman. Soon, it became a standard part of the French repertoire for both men and women. This instrument gained quick popularity in part for two reasons. First, a new fad had taken hold of the aristocracy at the time, the pastoral ideal. Much in the same way that modern people think of pirates as lackadaisical and fun sailors, aristocrats thought of peasants as living a simple, relaxing life, herding cattle and roaming the hillsides. Included in this image was the veal, having never left the folk traditions of the French peasantry, and with the aristocracy idealizing all folk traditions during this time, the veal seemed quaint and fun. The second reason was the popularity of another instrument of the time, a variant of the bagpipe called the musette. Like the veal, it had a set of drones, and it also had a range very similar to that of the veal, with the veal only having a smaller range by a few diatonic notes. As such, it was often simple for vealists to play parts written for the musette on the veal instead. Drones on this instrument. All the drones are cylindrical, with a cylindrical bore and with double reeds. And uh, 
That's what made the Muset sound so special, that combination of double reeds with cylindrical, small cylindrical bore. So here on this instrument you have five drones. And in this piece you have to 2 meter 20 of bore. Five, five drones with a total length of 2 meter 20. So if you look on the base, that's the inlet. You have the first channel going here downstairs and then it makes a turn here, it makes another turn here, it goes below, makes another turn here and comes here. That's the first outlet. If you close this and you keep this open, this channel is making another turn here, going downstairs, last turn here and that's the second outlet. So you have two notes on, on the base. We can tune it in there. And that's the longest of all these pipes, but the calculation is that you have one, two, three, four, five, six times 15 centimeters. <laughs> so it's a very long pipe. <laughs> okay, so you can close the drones here, they are opened. If you do, you can tune them, they make the tune lower, and that's closed. So it's shut. Mm -hmm. Okay? First, demonstrate the two chanters. Yeah, place with a closed fingering, one finger, one note, or just push one key. That's the same result. Very, very small chanter. The length of the board is something like this, and it's six notes. Mm -hmm. And these notes are the high register of the instrument. So when you play on this chanter, this is still playing, so you hear a drone. The demand for veals was suddenly high. Composers quickly set to writing music that included the veal, a task made particularly difficult due to the inclusion of the drone strings, which were seen as a vital part of its sound. Likewise, luthiers began experimenting with the form to improve upon it. But it would be one man in particular who would revolutionize the instrument into the form that has come to be the standard for the last 300 years. Around the year 1716, an instrument craftsman named Henri Baton was struggling to keep up with the massive demand for veals, much like his contemporaries. What's more, the guitar and lute had lost popularity only recently, leaving him with a large surplus of unused bodies for each. Looking to not waste completed work and materials, and desperate to meet demand, he began using these leftover bodies to construct new veals, experimenting and improving upon the design until settling on the six-string model that would become the standard for French instruments, though only five would be used at a time, with three drones and both melody strings. He also would add flourishes such as elaborately carved headstocks and trimming. These changes firmly established the veal as a court instrument. Despite this standardization, however, it was rare for two veals to look alike, with intricate ornamentation, varying body shape, and even tonal experiments such as greater melody ranges. The only instruments in greater demand were the harpsichord, the flute, and the violin. Even so, the veal maintained an unsavory reputation as being the instrument of choice for fashion chasers. In a French novel from 1744, author Jean-Baptiste Jordan describes just this kind of person. As translated by Robert A. Green, quote, 
She is found at all the parties, does not miss a restaged opera, a new play, a day of excitement. She must stay in bed for the slightest imposition, constantly complain about her color or the lack of vivacity in her eyes, the negligence of her adornment, have the vapors on command, oh, an essential article, speak Italian, play the veal, drink champagne, finally, laugh, sing, never be on time, and go to bed at 4 a.m. End quote but this popularity would prove relatively short-lived. The sound and respectability of the viol was closely tied with the viol, as both its playing technique and tonal ideals were based on it, and the latter reached its peak of popularity in 1720. While the value of the viol had been in question from its inception all throughout its lifespan in France, the changing tastes of the aristocracy would see the instrument almost entirely abandoned by 1760, relegating it once again to the rural regions of France. But the lowest point of the instrument was yet to come. In 1789, the French Revolution marked a moment of extreme and far-reaching social disruption. Myriad failed reforms and poor decisions by the French government had led to food shortages, massive governmental debt, and widespread social discontent, leading to a period of French history known as the Reign of Terror. Over the course of a year, beginning in 1793, approximately 300,000 people were arrested and 17,000 people were executed under the newly invented guillotine, and according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, up to another 10,000 died awaiting trial. But the instigators of the revolution surmised that simply removing or executing those in positions of leadership was insufficient to completely abolish sentiment towards the monarchical system, and so they set about destroying symbols of their rule, including paintings, sculptures, buildings, and musical instruments. While the veal had fallen out of fashion long before the French Revolution, many instruments were still housed in the great mansions of the aristocracy, and they were confiscated, catalogued, then frequently destroyed. Very few of these instruments survived. Once again, the veal was relegated to the countrysides of central France, where a tradition was maintained. Notably, they would be played during public ceremonies, especially weddings. The instruments made in the aftermath of the French Revolution were often made to a similar specification as those for the aristocracy, in part because the most famous makers, named the Pajot, had ties to the old royal French court. And so, in France, these improved instrument designs first imagined by Henri Baton would survive. But in the rest of Europe, the Symphonia would continue its tradition as a beggar's instrument, to the point that music and literature would see Symphonia players and beggars as synonymous. One of the most famous instances of this is the German song Der Leiermann. It describes an old man outside a village, barefoot on the ice in the winter, perpetually cranking his lyre with an empty plate in front of him as dogs growl at him. France became one of the final places with a regular folk tradition for the Symphonia, but eventually, this too would begin to disappear in the early 1900s as interest in folk music traditions gradually evaporated. But unexpectedly, in the 1960s and 70s, interest increased in both Europe and America, and this interest included the veal in France. There were still a few old practitioners of 1800s folk music to teach it to this new, interested generation, and through these people, a living tradition of folk music could continue. Over the past few decades, the hurdy-gurdy has gained a limited space in public consciousness. Most people have only heard the term in the Donovan song Hurdy-Gurdy Man. However, the sound of it will occasionally be discovered by composers who utilize it in order to evoke a rustic, pagan, or piratical ambience, such as in the soundtracks to the show Black Sails and the games The Witcher 3 and Sea of Thieves. This is a modern hurdy-gurdy, minus one key in for repair. This instrument is arranged in the closest thing to a standard that it has. Some have more strings, some have fewer, but nearly all of them worldwide will be built with this basic structure. The most important part of the instrument is here. 
the wheel whose axle is turned by the crank on the side. The wheel bows each of the six strings which run the full length of the instrument, and each of these strings may be placed on the wheel or removed at any time. There are three different kinds of strings. The first are the drone strings, which are tuned in harmony with one another. There are the bass drones, which are on the far side of the instrument and make a deep, throaty sound. There is also an additional drone on the near side, tuned an octave above the lowest bass. The second kind of string is the trompette, which is perhaps the most unique part of the instrument. When the wheel is turned normally, it acts as another drone, but the bridge for the string is not actually attached to the instrument itself. It's only held in place by the tension of the string. When the string is engaged and the wheel is turned hard enough, it buzzes. By rhythmically jerking the wheel forward, the player can create a beat. The third and final kind of strings are the melody strings, which run through this key chest, come out the other side, and wrap around the tuning pegs. But it's in the key chest that the instrument becomes its most complicated. The keys each poke through the top side of the key chest, and attached to each key are wooden or metal tangents, in this case wood, that make contact with the string when the key is pressed. This works like a fretboard on a guitar, except instead of pushing the string to the fret, the fret is pushed to the string, and when released, they slide back down and out of the way. Each of these tangents must be tuned manually, which can be arduous. The keys, due to their rudimentary design, also create a percussive clacking sound every time they're played. Nowadays, the melody strings are often tuned to an octave, which produces a very unique sound. Each string has a small bit of raw, long-strand cotton wrapped around the point where it meets the wheel, both to protect the string from being eaten away and to soften the sound which is extremely harsh otherwise. All of this comes together to create a sound often compared to a bagpipe, but distinct from it, like so. This complexity means that half of playing the instrument is in its maintenance. Hurdy-gurdists are universally familiar with its inner workings, and tinkering for the right sound is mandatory. Modern hurdy-gurdies will often add to this basic design. The most common changes are more strings, in the most extreme cases 11 or more, not including sympathetic strings. Other amenities include capos and remote switches for the drones, as well as unique methods of constructing the wheel to resist temperature and humidity changes. Many modern hurdy-gurdies will also include pickups to create what are often called electric hurdy-gurdies, though they are almost universally electroacoustic instruments. No matter how much gets added or changed, and no matter what body type is applied, this instrument has an unmistakably antiquated visage. It looks like an ancient machine. 